ordered anyhow. Now, the, the question is then, how does the thing in the first place get ordered? And why, when we look at any ordinary situation, which is only partly ordered, we can conclude that it probably came from more order. If I look at a tank of water, in which it's very dark blue on this side, and very clear white water here, and sort of bluish water in between, and I know that that thing has been left alone for 20, 30 minutes, then I, can only, I will guess that it got this way because it was bluer before. For instance, if I find, I mean, that the separation was more complete in the past, if I find, for example, two objects, uh, if I, uh, well, well, this is a good example of any. If I wait longer, then the blue and white would get more intermixed. And if I know that this thing has been left alone for a sufficiently long time, I can conclude something about the past condition. The fact that it's smooth in here could only arise because it was much better in the past, much more satisfactorily separated. Because if it weren't more satisfactorily separated in the past, in the time since then, it would have gotten more mixed up than it is. So, it is therefore possible to tell from the present something about the past. Although physicists are really not do this much, physicists usually like to think that what you, all you have to do is say, these are the conditions and what happens next. But all our sister scientists have a completely different problem. In fact, all the other things that are studied, history, geology, and astronomical history, all have a problem of this kind. I find they're able to make predictions of a completely different type than a physicist. A physicist says, in this condition, I'll tell you what'll happen next. But a geologist will say something like this. I have dug in the ground and I found certain kinds of bones. I predict that if you dig in the ground, you'll find a similar kind of bone. Historian, although he talks about the past, can do it by talking about the future. When he says Napoleon uh, exists, or Napoleon was, or that the French Revolution was in 1783, he means that if you look in another book about this re French Revolution, you'll find the same date. <laughs> 1789, maybe. <laughs> That's pretty accurate for a physicist to have the third decimal figure. <laughs> the three figures. Man. Now, uh, the, situ the thing that he says is that he makes a kind of prediction about something he has never looked at before. Documents that have still to be found. He predicts that the documents, if there's something written about Napoleon, will coincide with what is written in the other documents. And the question is how that's possible. And the only way that that's possible is to suggest that the past of the world was more organized in this sense than the present. Some people have proposed at one time, the physicists only have proposed this, some physicists, <laughs> that the way it got ordered was this that the whole universe is just irregular in motions like this. And then if you see, if you wait long enough with uh, five atoms, of course it can get separated accidentally. And all that has happened is that in the world has been going on and going on and going on and going on and going on, and it fluctuated, that's what this is called, when it gets a little bit out of ordinary, it fluctuated, and uh, now we're watching the fluctuation undo itself again. How do we think, how do we know that isn't the case? You say, oh, well, how long you would have to wait? I know, but if it didn't fluctuate far enough to be able to produce evolution, to be able to produce an intelligent person, we wouldn't have noticed it. So we had to keep waiting until we were alive to notice it. So we have to have at least that big a fluctuation. But this thing, this is incorrect, I believe. I think that's a ridiculous theory for the following reason. That if the world were much bigger and there were atoms all over the place, and they started from a completely mixed up condition, all over. And I happen only to look at the atoms here. And I find that the atoms here are separated. I have no way to conclude that the atoms anywhere else are separated. In fact, if the thing were a fluctuation and I noticed something odd, the most likely way that it got there is that there's nothing odd anywhere else. That is, the only, I have to borrow odds, so to speak, to get this thing lopsided. And there's no use on borrowing too much. It, it's much more likely of all the possible ways in which these six atoms can be on one side and these seven on the other side, 
of all of the possibilities, the most likely condition of the rest of the world is mixed up. And therefore, an astronomer looking at a star that he's never, although when we look at the stars and we look at the world, we see it's ordered, it could be a fluctuation. The prediction would be that if we look at a place that we haven't looked at before, it'll be disordered in a mess. That the separation of the matter into stars which are hot and space which is cold, which we've seen, although if you say it could be a fluctuation, then in places that we haven't looked, we would expect that the stars are not separated from the space. And since every time we make a prediction that in a place that we haven't looked, we'll see the same statement about Napoleon, or we'll see stars in a similar condition, or that we'll see bones like the bones that we've seen before, the success of all those sciences indicate that the world did not come from a fluctuation, but came from a condition which was more separated, more organized in the past than at the present time. And therefore, I think it's necessary that to add to the physical laws the hypothesis that in the past, the universe was more ordered in the technical sense, uh, less mixed up, than it is today. And that this statement is the added statement that's needed to make sense and to make an understanding of the irreversibility. That statement, of course, is itself lopsided in time. It says something about the past is different than the future. But it comes outside of the province of what we ordinarily call physical laws because we try today to distinguish we, Maybe someday we won't do that, but we do today distinguish between the laws which tell how something moves if you start it in a certain way, and those statements about how the universe got the way it gets, or has been, what it was in the past, and what it's going to get to be. No, excuse me. The statement of the physical laws which govern the rules by which the universe develops, and the law which states the condition that the world was in the past. That's considered to be astronomical history. Perhaps someday that will also be a part of physical law. Now, there are a number of interesting features of irreversibility that I think I would like to illustrate. One of them is to, is to see how exactly an irreversible machine really works. Suppose that we build something that we know ought to work only one way. And what I'm going to build is a, we a wheel with a ratchet on it. A ratchet means just this, that we have a notched wheel steps. So, I've drawn the wrong way for what I'm used to thinking about it. No, I had it right. <laughs> Maybe this way, there's another notch and a sawtooth wheel like this with sharp up notches and relatively slow down notches all the way around. And then, this is a wheel on a shaft. And then on this thing, there's a little piece of pole, a thing called a pole, which is on a pivot here and which is held down by a spring. It gets in the way of the wheel, but that's small technical difficulty. <laughs> this is two-dimensional, and actually it's set a little bit below. <laughs> now, this wheel can only turn one way. If you try to turn it this way, then these straight edge part of the teeth get jammed against the pole and it doesn't go. Whereas if you turn it the other way, it just goes right over the thing and snaps down. Pop, 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 pop. This way you use them in clocks, so when you wind watches, they have this kind of a thing inside so that you only can wind it one way. And after you wind it, it holds a spring. And now we want to discuss, you see, it's completely irreversible in the sense that the wheel can only turn one way. Now this irreversible machine, this wheel that can only turn one way, has been imagined that you could use it for a very useful thing, a very interesting thing. Because of molecular irregularities, because of molecular motion, Perpetual motion, uh, there's a perpetual motion of, of molecules, and if you build a very delicate instrument, it'll always jiggle because it's being bombarded irregularly by the air molecules in the neighborhood. So what's oh, very clever, we'll connect this with a shaft, which is hard to illustrate in three dimensions. It goes way out here. We connect this to it with a shaft, with a vein, with a set, a wheel that has four veins. Actually, my angles of things have gotten a little bit mixed up. Look down on the shaft, this thing's got four veins like this. And those are bombarded, they're in a box of gas here. And they're bombarded all the time by the molecules irregularly. So the thing is pushed sometimes one way, sometimes the other way. But when it's pushed one way, the, this thing gets jammed. But when it's pushed the other way, it goes around. So we find a wheel perpetually going around and we have a kind of perpetual motion. That's because this wheel is irreversible. But actually, we have to look into the details. 
The way this works is that when the wheel goes one way, it lifts the pawl up and then the pawl snaps down against the next tooth. And then it will bounce. If it's perfectly elastic, it'll go bounce, 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 bounce all the time. And the wheel can just go down around the other way when the pawl accidentally bounces up. So this will not work unless it's true that when the pawl comes down, it sticks or stops or bounces and cuts out. If it bounces and cuts out, there must be what we call damping or friction again. And then they're falling down and bouncing and stopping, which is the only way this will work one way. Heat is generated by the friction. So this part of the wheel over here will get hotter and hotter. But how, however, when it begins to get quite warm, something else happens. Just as there's Brownian motion or irregular motions in the gas here, so whatever this is made out of, the parts that this is made out of are getting hotter and are becoming more irregular. So a time comes when this is hot enough that the pole is simply jiggling because of the molecular motions of the things on the inside. And so it bounces up and down on here because of molecular motion, the same thing that was making this vein turn around. And in bouncing up and down on here, it is up as much as it is down. And when it is up as much as it is down, a tooth can go either way. As a matter of fact, the thing will be driven backward. If this one was hot and this one was cold, the wheel that you thought would go only one way will go the other way. Because in the terrible bouncing up and down of this wheel, every time it comes down, it comes down on an inclined plane and so pushes the wheel this way. Then it bounces up again, comes down on another inclined plane, and so on. And so if this side is hotter than this side, it'll go around this way. What's it got to do with the temperature of this side? Suppose I didn't have that at all. Oh, then if it's pushed forward by falling on an inclined plane, the next thing that'll happen is it'll bounce against that tooth and the wheel will bounce back. But in order to prevent the wheel from bouncing back, we put a damper on it and put veins in the air so it can't go back. <laughs> and then it, can only, it will go one way, but the wrong way. And so it turns out that no matter how you design it, a wheel like this will go the one way if this side is hotter and go the other way if this side is hotter. But after there's a heat exchange between the two and everything is calmed down, it will neither go one way or the other. And so that's the technical way in which the phenomena of nature will go one way as long as they're out of equilibrium, as long as one side is quieter or, than the other, or one side is bluer than the other. The conservation of energy would, think, would let us think that we have as much energy as we want. We, nature never loses or gains energy. Yet the energy of the sea, for example, the thermal motion of all the atoms in the sea is practically unavailable to us. In order to get that energy organized, herded, used, make it useful, make it available for use, we have to have some place that's at a different temperature. We have to use a difference in temperature or else we'll find that the, although the energy is there, we cannot make use of it. There's a great difference between energy and availability of energy. The energy of the sea, for example, is a large amount, but it's not available to us. I think I can give an analogy to give some idea of what the difficulty is this way. The conservation of energy means that the total energy in the world is kept the same. But in the irregular jiggling, that energy can be spread about so uniformly that there's no, in a certain circumstances, that there's no way to make more go one way than the other. There's no way to control it anymore. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I have had uh, a going to the beach with several, many towels and so on, and sitting happily on the beach and having a tremendous downpour suddenly come, picking up the towels as quickly as you can and running into the bathhouse. Then you start to dry yourself. And you find that this towel's a little wet, but it's drier than you are. And you keep drying this one, then you find that one's too wet. It's wetting you as much as it's drying you, and you try another one, and pretty soon you discover a horrible thing. All the towels are damp, and so are you. <laughs> And then you pick, keep picking them up and putting them down and rearranging them, and there's no way to get any drier, no matter how many towels, even though you have many towels. Because there's no difference, in some sense, between the wetness of the towel and the wetness of yourself. 
I could invent a kind of a quantity which I could call ease of removing water or, uh, yeah, let's call it the ease of removing water. The towel has the same ease of removing water from it as you have. And so when you touch the towel to you, as much water comes off of you from the towel to you as it goes from you to the towel. It doesn't mean there's the same amount of water in the towel.